Our gracious Heavenly Father, I praise you for the privilege and the opportunity that's ours to worship you in spirit and in truth. I ask that the Holy Spirit might take this time and just strip away all the foolishness and the error, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. We are keenly aware of our limitations. More than that, the energy of our enemy. Oh, that the Holy Spirit might open our hearts and our eyes to truth, for we know that there is no other teacher. These things I ask in Christ's name. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the Epistle to the Colossians, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were at the 23rd verse of the first chapter, Colossians 1, verse 23. We had been looking uh, in the last couple of paragraphs at the supremacy of the person and the work of our Savior. When we reached the 21st verse, we had the Holy Spirit telling us very clearly that Christ redeemed us when He died in our place. I pointed out to you that 400 years ago, 400 plus some odd years ago, the unanimous theological conclusion of professing Christianity was that Jesus Christ died for His own and in doing that, he presented them holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. And that he did that when he died, not when his people decided that that would become a reality. But no longer is it the unanimous opinion that Jesus Christ, Christ died for his own. By his will, as John 1.13 declares, and at his timing, as James 1.18 declares. Nor is it modern Christianity's conclusion that we are truly, genuinely, wholly unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight. But it, it is virtually the unanimous opinion that Jesus Christ died a meaningless death for goats and tear. The world says that you once did not belong to God, but then you found Him. Whereas Christ said just the opposite. He said that we were always His and that He found us. And that He found us when we were not seeking God, seeking after God. As sheep, we went astray and our shepherd found us. We returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. The emphasis of this ministry is on Christ having chosen us, and as a result, we are hated by the religious system just as his people back then were. The truth of election usually causes offense to those who have been brought up to believe that it is up to man to decide for himself whether he will become one of God's children or not. The very fact that the Lord used the illustration of birth ought to settle that matter once and forever, but it does not. We don't like to be told that the choice is not ours, even when the fact is plainly stated in Scripture. John chapter 15. And this modern error is the basic assumption of modern mass evangelism. When it's pointed out that the implication of hundreds of passages of Scripture, familiar to most Christians and non-Christians alike, demonstrates clearly that this view is not a strictly biblical one, there's argument. What offends so powerfully is the discovery that such freedom of cooperation simply does not exist. 
Man is truly in spiritual bondage as it regards this matter, and he has no power to assist in the process of his own redemption, his own new birth, being born from above. It is this that causes offense. And it is this, folks, that necessitated this book. Point out to people that we are not born again by the will of man, John 1.13, and that it is of God's own will and not ours that we are born from above at the timing in which God chooses, James 1.18, that it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy, Romans chapter 9, that repentance is granted to us and is not a contribution that we make of ourselves, Romans chapter 2, and that the exercise of saving faith is nothing less than the gift of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 1, that it is God and not we ourselves who shines the light of the gospel in our hearts. Acts chapter 16, Revelation chapter 3. You point all of this out and suddenly we meet with strong reaction even among those who are the Lord's children. Human emotion takes the place of revelation. Many are personally offended because they feel that they're being reduced to mere puppets, even though their Bibles declare the sovereignty of God's grace. So they see it as a dangerous doctrine to pro proclaim publicly, and they're convinced that because it offends people, that it just it can't be true. Yet the truth of the matter is that none will be drawn to the Lord unless they are drawn by the Father, and this will happen only if they are God's elect. We are surrounded by a liberal climate of theological opinion, especially in these final days in which we're living. A great number of believers who are otherwise well acquainted with their Bibles are, seem to be strangely unaware of the fact that election is maintained throughout the Old and the New Testaments, and nowhere more clearly so than in the Gospel of John, which tempted me to begin a study in John rather than Colossians when we finish the epistle to the Romans. Because an honest examination of John with even a half-open mind will quickly show that Christ chose us. We did not choose Christ. And these are our Lord's own words. Within the first 14 verses of John, we find the fact of divine election and human inability where we're told that the power to become a child of God is not based on the will of man or the will of the flesh or upon blood relationship, but solely upon the will of God. In chapter 6 of this gospel, we seem to have a, a turning point in the Lord's teaching on this matter. For here, He deliberately set out to underscore the fact that while the invitation to come is broadcast to all men. Only those will come or can come whom the Father has enabled to respond because He chose them. When the Lord said in John chapter 6, No man can come to me except the Father who has sent me draw him, He touched a very sensitive place in the hearts of His listeners. And we read in in verse 60 of chapter 6, that many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? They took offense at this. So what did Jesus do? 
Did he soften his message? Did he tone down his, his words? No. He very deliberately repeated what he had said. Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him by my Father, of my Father. And as might be expected, the record tells us that from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And that is exactly why this channel has such a small following. Nothing has changed since that time. There is nothing new under the sun. This was not due to some decision on my part. I have no control over the popularity of this channel, and I thank God for that. And folks, you can follow me around all day trying to convince me that you accepted Christ, and as a result of what you did, you became born again, but it will not change the truth of the fact that you did that because Christ died in your place, and therefore it was the new man, not the old, the new man that God quickened to life, that accepted Christ, not the flesh, not the old man. The flesh cannot receive the things of the Spirit of, of God. The natural man cannot please God. Why do you not hear what I say, says the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 8? Because you cannot hear my word. Folks, no one, neither you nor I nor anyone has ever become a child of God by accepting Jesus Christ. That's, that's the biblical truth. You may not want to accept that. You may not want to believe that. But that is what this book says. It wasn't conditional. It wasn't based on what you did. The only way, the only reason, the only way that you came to accept Jesus Christ was because Christ died in your place and because He gave you new life first. You, you were first made alive. You were His when you accepted Jesus Christ. You did not become His by accepting Jesus Christ. That is what this book says. Yet there are many, millions, millions of Christians that don't believe that, and I sure miss your fellowship. So how then do you hear? Well, you hear with new ears. How do you believe? You believe with a new mind. How do you live? You live with a new heart. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh by means of death. When did he reconcile you? When you accepted him? No. When he died. Where could you possibly read in that text that you did it when you believed, when you accepted, when you received, when you repented, when you were baptized, or any number of other things? No man seeks after God. Christ redeemed you when He died by means of His death in your place. What was the result of His death in your place? He presented you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. And no wonder it's called the finished work of Jesus Christ. And then we looked at verse 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you've heard, which was preached in all creation, whereby I, Paul, was made a minister. And I pointed out to you that the certainty of continuance is the certainty of your reconciliation. Since we continue in the faith, and we will. That is clearly what the Greek text says. If you are perfectly satisfied to use the King James Version, since, you know, well, it was good enough for Paul, so it ought to be good enough for you, you still can't make the language say what most Christians think it says, that if you, that if you continue in the faith, you'll be reconciled. 
Even in plain English, it doesn't say that. And it's even clearer in the Greek. What the text says is He reconciled you. The text is saying that if you don't continue in the faith, you are not reconciled. If you are reconciled, you will continue in the faith. The text, folks, is speaking to God's children, God's elect, the family of God, the household of God. It is God telling us that we can have that certainty. That's what the verse is saying. It does not say that you can lose your reconciliation if you don't continue. What it says is that you are now reconciled if you continue in the faith. And the clear negative of that is if you don't continue in the faith, well, then you're, you're not now reconciled. That is what the text is teaching. I pointed it out that the Greek puts it in a first-class condition. It means that God in past time completely and perfectly grounded you and established you in Christ. He did it. You did not. The present passive participle does not say that you're moving yourself away from the hope of the gospel, that, that at, some, at, at some point in time you won't believe in Christ anymore. And it is not your hope in the gospel, I pointed that out, but the gospel's hope, it's a genitive, the gospel's certainty. Verse 23 continues, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. And the average Christian today believes that in the Old Covenant, a person was redeemed by keeping the law, and in the New Covenant, he's redeemed by accepting Christ. And if you just spend a few moments thinking about that, you'll realize that both of those things say that a person is redeemed by doing something. Christ did something, and you did something, and the, you know, the two of you working together you know, resulted in redemption. So man deserves, you know, part of the glory. What difference does it make whether in one place it was keeping the law and in another place that that was accepting Christ other than to say it's easier to accept Christ than it is to keep the law. But if that in fact is your opinion, then you're proclaiming that, that you do not accept the theological position of man's total depravity, which leads us back into the discussion or, or issue of election again. It has never ceased to amaze me how the Christian can say, you know, I believe, Steve, I believe in the total depravity of man and I believe a person is redeemed by accepting Jesus Christ. How can a totally depraved person accept Jesus Christ? Well, the truth is he can't. He must first be made alive. If you say, I believe in the total depravity of man, with one exception, and that is that God just kind of left a little opening here in, in, my, in this total mess I was in, this total depravity where a person can accept Christ, then folks, we are worlds apart. It all begins with our understanding of the fact that we were spiritually dead and had to be made alive before we, as a, as a person, could respond to God in any positive way. My Bible tells me that the natural man cannot enter the kingdom of God. My Bible tells me the natural man cannot hear the Word of God, that the natural man cannot receive the Spirit of God, that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, that the heart is incurably wicked, that the carnal mind is enmity against God and cannot please God, that it is with a new mind and a new heart that we accept Christ, a new will that is not totally depraved, one that is born of the Spirit. Even Moses said when he stood before the Red Sea, he, he told the people, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And I'm personally, I'm persuaded that if, that if God hadn't told Moses to say that, well, they would have tried to swim to safety and they probably would have, would have drowned. They wouldn't have made it. 
you know, as in trying to deliver themselves. If you're ever preaching a sermon on the Exodus, you want to make sure that you tell people the reason God told them to stand still is because they were going to turn tail and run. The only way that they had to run was swim, and they would have never made it. We see the same lesson with Uzzah. God didn't need His help with the ark. He touched it. He died. And, you know, I believe He went immediately into God's presence, which is a wonderful thing. You're not looking at a, we're not looking at a cruel God there. Point being, folks, salvation is of the Lord. We give Him all the glory. If you don't cotton to that idea, then folks, you're listening to the wrong channel. Why would you want to cling to some good in yourself? Why would you not want to cast yourself fully upon Christ, trusting in Him and not yourself? Praising God for having chosen you out of the world when you were not loving God or seeking after God, and then on top of it all, despite your own brethren that do, and that thinking that you're doing God a service, you know, by hating them for believing that God chose us. It's not just conviction of sin just to feel miserable about yourself and your failures and your, your guilty conscience, nor is it saving faith for a man to call on Christ, you know, just to soothe him and to cheer him up, make him feel better about himself, make him feel confident again. The gospel is not, are you happy? Are you satisfied? Do you want peace of mind? Do you feel that you failed? Are you fed up with yourself? Do you want a friend? Well, then just come to Christ and all will be well. No. True conviction of sin understands the weight of sin. That man, the seriousness of sin. That man is totally depraved, spiritually dead, and unable to remedy his lost condition by deciding to follow Christ. At his time, his will, and at his choosing. It reduces the absolute supreme sovereignty of God to nothing. It is in our understanding that He chose us. We did not choose Him, that God saved sinners. If you believe that you chose Him, you believe, in, in, in essence, folks, you believe that in the, ultimately, in the long run, that you've saved yourself. Because you held the final trump card. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. John 17, 14. And all you have to do to define the word world in that context is ask yourself who it was that was hating them. The religious system of their time. One that was based on human merit. The gospel of grace would make it, it would make sense to modern Christianity today if, if it had followed faithfully the exhortation of Paul's epistles and left the matter of new birth entirely in God's hands while it trained itself as sowers of the seed. If it had done that, then it, its hostility toward divine election would never have arisen. But modern evangelism sadly has abandoned the sovereignty of God's grace, and the total helplessness of man, believing that it has the power to give life a power that it simply does not have. Four hundred years ago, it was not this way. And folks, our beloved Redeemer is coming soon. And most... Believers that I know, they, they either they don't care if He returns or not. Or if they do, that that's all that they care about. Before lost souls can respond to God, they must first be made alive by His grace. Quicken us and we will call upon Your name. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, Cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. Psalm chapter 80. 
A man must be alive before he can exercise saving faith. John 11, Whosoever lives and believes in Me shall never die. Lives and believes in that order. And when you hear it, which was preached, which you have heard, verse 23, you know, you can't just skip over those words without realizing that in order to hear, God had to command light to shine in our hearts. We heard with God's command, with God's new life, God's new heart, and God's new ears. You cannot possibly make that text say that we heard with carnal ears, minds of the flesh. You may believe that the almighty, sovereign, majestic God of all creation the one who hung the stars in the sky, the one who created you, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, that, that He has a child someplace who can't hear and never will hear. I think the Almighty Eternal God declared that the Gospel is being proclaimed in all creation, and there's not one bit of exaggeration there. And it's the same gospel whereof I, Paul, was made a minister. It's an aorist. God did it. Made him a servant of that good news. God has proclaimed it in all creation. Now that doesn't mean to me that every human ear heard. It does mean to me that every child of God heard and will hear. Looking at verse 24 who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for His body's sake, which is the church. We share in His sufferings as members of His body. Remember, a servant is not above his master. The world religious system hated him. The ecclesiastical system will hate us. But with such a stark similarity as that, we can do nothing but rejoice. The gospel that is so widely preached today is psychological rather than spiritual. And it, it amounts basically to a form of brainwashing, in my opinion. This is all it can ever be. And the best defense against this is an absolute faithfulness in the preaching of election and the sovereign grace of God in our, in our present upside-down world just prior to our Lord's return for us. The need for such faithfulness is greater than ever. We are strangers and foreigners here. We've been made a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel's hope is a hope of certainty. We set our affections on things above, not on things below, but on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. For we have died and our lives are hid with Christ in God. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.